on the site regarding the site team what I will ask for is that everybody manages there's a battery pack there's the there's the camera itself it's in a case and then we have just a little micro SD uh, so if you could basically download that every day I've, I've been doing that but it's like it's a lot of work so maybe we can just divide all of that up do people have access to micro SD slots I've got two two micro SD readers um, so I'll bring that but yeah, the one the castle is just like this one, so you got a bunch of these that, that are good for time lapse. They're relatively decent outside, especially they look really nice. Uh, when, once you get to low light, it's a little worse. But we can get with an external battery pack. We run these like 12 hours very easy with a like a 10,000 milliamp hour battery bank. It runs for about 12 or more hours per day, so that's pretty good. Uh, we'll continue with that and do try to document. So, in today's today's lessons, let's look at uh, the document itself. Uh, let's talk about. Let's continue on. So we're in a shop. We're building. We built a lot of the corner modules and regular modules for the for the the house. The, the body count of that is about 30 or so that we've done already. So we're moving right along. Yesterday we've seen a good pickup of pace as after the first day of just people getting onboarded, we just cranked. So it was pretty good. It was quite good. Uh, we're ready to continue with that and probably uh, ideally get a lot of the windows and doors done today. We're, f we're finishing up the, the regular modules. Uh, but yeah, just uh, one inch at a time. Uh, over the next 10 days, we're trying to see if we can finish just about everything on it as we get better on developing the digital model as well. Uh, we'll continue with the digital model just to talk about if we have collaborative workflows, um, how do we make it most effective? So let's start with that. Uh, it's certainly a huge accounting task to keep track, track of, of everything, everything here. That's, That's kind of like the main thing. thing. But on, on a team, team CAD, CAD um, let's, let's talk about, about that. Um, then I'll talk, so today let's talk about the team CAD process, how just getting the mental framework around how, how that can happen efficiently. Second is the accounting of how do you keep track of everything, uh, including the best place, I mean right now still, like if you want to, we're seeing that people want to get, still, still are in the process of getting oriented up about how everything fits together. Digital models help on that. We do have the Sweet Home 3D technical model, and we'll just take a look at that and how to navigate that because actually there's a lot of insight in there. And we're using Sweet Home 3D primarily for the conceptual part, and you can get a lot of the concept out of it in terms of how the things fit together, kind of like little details. Where at the end of the day, you know, as if we're getting trained to build that, build and design, we have to understand those details. Uh, just about everything about it um, it's not as I wouldn't I would say it's not as complicated as a regular house where yeah I mean it's more complex the the modularity the fact that most modules are the same except they have differences at the end the core a lot of the core is quite similar and that's how you can manage uh, learning the entire system um, the intricacies come in when you get into um, I guess you would say making everything work at high performance and efficiency like you have to consider a lot of detail just like anyone would consider a lot of detail and here we're also optimizing each detail part of the trouble of accounting is that even in a CD home digital model in sweet home that's already that you know it's been generated earlier this year it's already outdated there's details that we've already improved upon and going upon the metaphor of software, you, you fix one bug after another, there's tens, hundreds of thousands of bugs. Well, each of those makes a complication for your, your tracking and CAD, so you have to be on top of the versioning and everything else. Uh, so that's, a, I think, largely an accounting challenge what we face. Yesterday we set up worksheet spreadsheets. Uh, when we were in a workshop, we were attaching names to how uh, to whoever was working on things so we can keep track of just what, what is being built because once you have these heavy modules you cannot just say 
um, like in a, on a computer, just drag your mouse to pick one up. It's like, okay, they're going to be deposited somewhere. They, wear, they weigh, they're heavy. Um, if you stack them in a pile, you can't get to the ones at the bottom, so you can't see, so you got to label things. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how to label things. We thought that one upgrade to cell phones would be a built-in laser on cell phones that could burn in QR codes. Imagine that. That would be a really cool thing. I'm sure somebody has that already. Probably like a cell, like a some device that burns in QR codes. Because then imagine you do that with your cell phone, which is something you carry around you all the time. And you can also identify it. It goes to a website to show you. Oh, this is this module. So that would that would be, I think, something perhaps even in the near term to see if we can access that because a, a very tiny laser even if you you know just put your cell phone kind of maybe does it for like a few seconds and it burns enough so that could add the the cell phone can then pick that up later on um, I think safe lasers probably exist that could do that I don't know um, but that would be a nice thing otherwise you, you can print out little labels QR code labels that would definitely help uh, that's one thing we can definitely do, uh, but you'd have to have a printer for that. Um, I'm just trying to keep track of the accounting. So let's talk about how about the group workflows. Okay, so we'll we'll cover this. So there's accounting issues on on managing the whole project. There's collaborative CAD, and then getting into the design of windows and doors. So the outcome would be for today would be can we understand more details uh, conceptually? It's like first start conceptually. Um, we already know some concepts, like all of our panels are say 4 by 8 feet, things like that. They've got a top plate, verticals, I mean inch by inch we're getting on top of the concepts and, and how to build it. Um, so once you see the concepts is when, once you understand them, then you can modify and be able to change things and to understand like if something needs to change in the field or if you got to substitute parts or any kind of modification or iteration, you're, you'll be able to do that after you understand the concept. So we'll go through the concept of doors and windows today, how, how you build them. For the CAD, so let's start with the CAD part. On a CAD part, if we're doing a large group workflow, yesterday we, we started the idea of download parts from architecture part library, and that was um, Put a link to that in the chat box. Uh, we do have a little architecture part library where we're downloading parts for the actual wall modules. And, and people built the modules out of these. Take a look at that in the chat box. Download, so, so in the architecture part library, you can download individual modules let me switch to sharing my screen. At the top you see composition. So, so at the top of the wall module library you see assemblies. So for example this assembly of the 9 foot outer frame it actually has more than the out, outer frame. Uh, we put actual detail of, of a real wall module. Um, that's a synthesis of parts that are below in the wall module part library. So you can quickly synthesize a real module, build module. And if you want to make various iterations or, or changes on it, you can use these parts. Um, you know, what's the motivation behind it? It seems like, oh, it's so simple. Why don't we just generate all this and be done with it? Well, the library is a, is a generative set. So if you want to modify this, you can. Like, you know, the modifications that we haven't touched are such as 10-foot modules. People, some people make ceilings that are 10 feet high. Uh, so that would be a ready modification. We don't have 10-foot part members here. We have 8 and 9, which is what we use in the house. We've got the the top bottom plates, the vertical studs, the blocking that goes in between where where like in this picture here the blocking is attached so you can attach the sheets of 4 by 8 plywood to the front and back on the interior there's the utility channel where all the electrical is going to run into so um, we're leaving these various features 
such as simplifying the electrical by allowing you to run wires in a cavity that you have ready access to and with a constraint that you also have to pass codes because um, we're not doing a standard of drilling holes through studs we're, we're just using this utility channel like a modular structure for all the electrical so uh, we're hacking the system at all times and this is where uh, we have to make sure that as in the exact b build process that we do that we make it through the codes because there's a particular inspection schedule like for example for electrical you have to have the framing and all the electrical has to be exposed yeah we can do that for example because the panels we leave the, leave the interior panel off until the very end until we're actually finishing the inside so yeah the inspector will actually see all the wires running through the walls um, even though we have this electrical channel the way we do it yeah it'll still be accessible and visible the way we do it but there is some consideration like for example we couldn't close up the front panel and expect to pass through like uh, we couldn't do that as the thing that we we go take to the field for two reasons one is inspection and two is that it's actually easier to put the interior siding later because it overlaps and it's very neat if you didn't overlap it and make it very neat it the inside wouldn't look as good on the outside what we're doing is using the battens to cover up the seams on the inside you might want a cleaner look so various details of how we build let's talk about the CAD workflow so when we were working with the architecture part library we were downloading things and and so yeah now we can download things from the library uh, but the next step is the concept of how how do you orient say there's a bunch of people working and you actually want to not only do the the modules but also how they fit within the the finished building you want to define a just define a coordinate system so you have to say something like in this design we're going to treat we'll simply treat here's the way we look at it from the front let's say the convenient thing is okay you're looking at this object that you're building define a coordinate system that's based on the natural physical look of it so if we're looking at the house from the front define the XYZ equals zero 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 like in the Cartesian coordinate system that's at the bottom left corner like if you're looking at a coordinate system bottom left corner that's gonna be your zero zero XYZ uh, everything zero there so that's one one way to look at it so if you're building a panel you're gonna know that in the FreeCAD window if you're starting in the XY plane well uh, the easiest way to build a wall panel which is vertical would be actually in the XZ plane if you're looking at the house from the front so you have to think conceptually okay now I've got a well-known system called Cartesian coordinates uh, that's well accepted since Descartes <laughs> When was he around? A few hundred years. That's what Cartesian comes from. Uh, square, uh, square thinking. Get it from Descartes. But that's useful because because a building is square. Uh, people build square buildings because square buildings are easy to build, and with with industrial product, unless you're building custom or natural homes. Cartesian coordinates are very useful. Uh, they're useful for us, they're useful in FreeCAD because you got the XYZ coordinate system in FreeCAD. So if you have a large group workflow, you can say, okay, um, now we're savvy enough, we're saying, okay, we're looking at the house from the front. We define front, back, left, right, and we can say, oh yeah, okay, hey people, uh, we'll divide the tasks. Uh, let's say a group of people takes the front wall, the back wall, the side walls, and so forth. And then you can start getting oriented around okay that's the that's the plane I have to work in so if you're building a, a wall that's in front of you the front wall most convenient would be the XZ coordinate if you're building the side walls that would be like if you define the corner the bottom left hand corner of you looking at the house 
as the zero 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 point, then the sidewalls would actually be the YZ plane, right? The back wall would also be XZ, X, X, uh, yeah, XZ, just like the front. Um, so with that kind of awareness, if people can think spatially, now spatial thinking, you have to develop that. Um, you have to start picturing this in your mind. It's a skill you develop. It's, it's something that you think about and you can kind of like picture this in your mind. Some people are better at it inherently than others but it's just a skill that you develop if you practice that you can develop a, a three-dimensional thinking uh, mindset which allows you then to say say you're designing anything you you're, you'll be able to orient yourself and say oh, okay I want to design this in the XZ plane because I know for example the wall module because I know I'm looking at the front frame and then I don't have to even turn it in order to for that to fit in the building so there's a spatial orientation that you have to pay attention to and once a whole team gets very familiar with that uh, people can do the CAD much more readily and then integrate it at the end more rapidly but you can also just say I'm gonna just work in um, just the XY plane so that's the first thing that comes up in FreeCAD like you know don't confuse you don't want to get confused you start working in XY plane well if you work with that, you'll have extrusions in a Z direction, so um, you know, that will determine the kind of geometries you can, you can build. For example, it would be very convenient to use the XY plane for the, the second story floor or the roof where you're looking at it from the top down. If you're looking from the top, that's the XY plane. And that would be convenient to, to draw that out, like say the, the joists that make the floor, draw them out looking from the, from the top. <clears throat> Uh, so, so depending on what you're building, if you know what you're building, you, you would select the right viewpoint to do it. If, so in a collaborative workflow, uh, if you want to coordinate all that information effectively. Now, if you're just using a part library that you're going to use it for all kinds of walls, right? The left, right, front, back walls, then you have to rotate things. Um, so how do, you, how do you orient everybody, like if you're working like that, to actually put together a building effectively if you got all these planes how do you know well if you define your coordinate system uh, you can start one one document one CAD document that's maybe like a placeholder into which uh, s say you draw a foundation in one document then if because this, this is a real workflow we start with a foundation great so how do you fit all the walls on it in a large workflow you can say um, in our system here we've divided the walls into there's modules 1 through 23 on the first floor but if we say okay we divide these specific modules by everybody uh, if you know which wall it falls on you can take that for example the foundation drawing and say oh, okay I'm, I need to put that there and that's our reference point so you can work off a common coordinate system like this file of a foundation so that every person puts their module at the they they work in their 3D CAD document, they can actually work in a positionally correct location so that when you merge all the files together, they actually line up next to each other. But you have to have a reference, like for example, a, a foundation drawing um, or just real good knowledge of coordinates. Like you can say, okay, if I'm working at 0, 0, 0, I know that you know 32 feet over uh, if in your doc, you, you actually look at the XYZ coordinate, which is in the information on your FreeCAD file, if you see, oh yeah, that's now 32 on the X, well, you know you're all the way at the right corner of the house. If you define the coordinate system, like we all agree that the house is 0, 0, 0 at the bottom left corner. So you can, uh, you can coordinate positionality that way. Now, when people are working on individual files, and so we're doing all the right now all the modules that we have built they're not positionally correct so the next step would be positionally correct once we define okay here's the foundation we're working with let's say uh, next step would be take that file go back into FreeCAD put it in the right place save it and upload it again memory's cheap you know you got all these individual files we can do that we can take a finished CAD mod model module and then add the correct positional locations. That's positionally correct uh, files. So that means you've achieved effectively what the 
the constraints in constraint based workflows the basically assembly assembly workflows assembly where you, you're using functionality like of here's how you connect things together by putting things in a in a correct place on a known coordinate system you effectively achieve a an assembly workflow um, without locking down a file <clears throat> typically files uh, get locked down in the industry when people uh, when a professional CAD team works on some file they will, they will lock lock, uh, lock that lock part down. down the way that we work is we all the time echo Jeff still echo can you uh, silence it or whatever um, the idea here is behind this kind of a merge workflow if, I mean if you can if you try to scale it to many many parts being done at the same time uh, with a large team you cannot really lock down files um, the way we our philosophy here is check what the latest <laughs> upload is in a part library you've got the authority as long as you check you download the latest one you know you're wor working with the latest one the rule here is as soon as you have some progress upload it use the wiki in fact as a backup uh, which allows then anybody else to catch up to the latest progress pretty much in real time without locking down files so that's that's one way to to do a, a large workflow where you understand that you you have open access to all the files we throw the reconciliation meaning like okay verification and and final submission of a final design to as far back as possible but in the meantime do the iterative design like keep uploading and and reworking the files people can kind of work it out with themselves at the module level before the final assembly so if that module is in the correct place you can work on that and then merge it into the final document so say you gotta make an error connection correction you don't work on a final file you work on a module file that you then merge back into the final and even on a module level if you make break the module into parts if you want to rework the parts you would work in the individual part files before you assemble into the module file so you can take modularity at any depth you can take it at the level of parts modules assemblies or super assemblies and universes and so forth so that's that's a basic thing about the positionality to to think about just geometry select geometry that's that's going to be the most convenient for you to work in uh, for the final product but you have to develop that skill that's something you learn and the reward of that is once you learn that you can visualize that then to transfer something to CAD is is very quick literally real time or like within like minutes or a few minutes you can CAD up things because you you're effective you, you understand how the coordinate system within FreeCAD works you, you're familiar with it enough but still just using the basic sketches extrusions that the, the feature on a feature exercise if you guys know that basic workflow gets you quite far uh, in terms of creating constructing geometries <clears throat> the the features such as like poking holes in things or building things up that corresponds a lot to reality like when you drill things or say when you weld things to put things together you can think of like a feature on a feature as something you welded upon a former piece of metal for example or if you're working in wood uh, the feature on a feature would be okay one piece of wood that you added to another piece of wood uh, things like that so so always keep in mind the the correspondence to the physical reality and and my claim was that the merge kind of workflow the very basic workflow makes you think about how things go together and how then they're processed afterwards uh, so that's a useful way for realistic design where you you're quite close to the actual reality because in CAD you're building it just like you would build it in real life 
and and that's a principle we go by here the CAD can only assist you it can help you understand how you're gonna build the thing in real life so um, and then getting the physical build experience makes your CAD process better uh, that means you're starting to design more realistic things more buildable things and then once you get really good in CAD you never need to prototype un until the very very end um, so you can spend 99 percent of your time on a CAD and the build is like that that's what we learned over the years here for example the first power cube I would go out there and build it because I didn't know how it would go together after building it a few times I said okay now I know how these parts go together why don't I not build it in physical life start using CAD um, and at that time FreeCAD actually wasn't really available yet so we were like messing with SketchUp and I never really did CAD a long time ago until FreeCAD since about 2016 when FreeCAD got really good and then okay now we have an open source tool chain um, and so forth and a powerful tool chain that can be uh, amended to any purpose you like but at the end of the day that implies that the the design process becomes largely digital it becomes like software because if you are really good and you know what you can build then you don't need to build until very 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 end and that's the that's the rapid that's the concurrent set based design or second Toyota paradox that's that's what that is about the second Toyota paradox means that's what the company Toyota uses but what they do is they delay the final product as long as they can as they as long as long as possible because they're doing excessive prototyping not like maybe one or two prototypes but like 10 or 20 they go nuts at that until they prove out every single part and proving it out may also mean CAD and then you build it at the very very end so I would say that a really good design process when when you're experienced in the build part is like the nine I would probably say realistically 99 to 1 ratio of design time to build time but that's completely consistent with our idea of extreme manufacturing it's it's exactly that we know exactly how things go together and we have designed it for team workflows and therefore the one day builds are possible like when we build the printer here I mean that's a small thing but yeah do that in a day but the larger things like the tractor or the brick press we can do that in that kind of time um, partly because well lar the, the biggest reason why we can do that is is the modular design so that's the thing so, um, but in general the the CAD time should be excessive the build time should be minimal also for safety reasons because when you're working with heavy things um, you can get injured and things can fall on you so you do want to make sure you know everything before you, you build within CAD that's a way to simulate things so that's a little bit on uh, the CAD workflows um, once we have refined the all the modules the next step is to make it really accessible for people so it's it's really about user interface design and things like that like when we finish up all the models here then we can get largely into okay how do you modify this this system for many different things and put an easy interface so people can build it We've talked about things like gamification where within a game you can throw down a pile of materials and people can build it within the game that comes only from accurate digital models but you can get fancy on what what you have once you have a a full digital model you can do anything so things like designers there are web-based designers of new versions which also extract bills of materials automatically that's all that's all game at that point so that gets me into say let's talk about accounting now so one so I mentioned automated BOM generation there's a page on the wiki for that uh, so let's go to automated BOM generation 
Uh, so in FreeCAD, just just to get people familiar with what that looks like, so take a look at the link. I'll share my screen. I'll go over that briefly because this is the relevance of that is on an enterprise side. Once we're building things, we're building new iterations. Uh, and also for making a user interface to make this easy online, you can uh, eventually we'll get there. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, the basic concept is that you just you're just naming your parts in a structured way, like you you would name your lumber, like for example, two by four pre-cut stud or whatever, nine foot pre-cut stud, whatever. Keep track of that uh, in a naming convention within the part tree uh, and within. And I'll show. Let's go through one example of, of what makes this feasible because the concept is easy. It's like you've got a part tree and you have every single part in there so you can simply parse it. There's actually a way in, in this page, the FreeCAD BOM generator actually shows this is how you simply extract the spreadsheet of all the parts that's in a spreadsheet function within FreeCAD. And then out of that, you go into any word counter application online or whatever and you just count words effectively so if you saw two by four pre-cut stud uh, it counts it one and it is automated counting uh, so there's just very basics there like one thing is keep it one word two by four no spaces pre-cut stud like just keep it one word so it's easy easy to do with even like a single word counter um, I mean you can have more complicated phrases with multiple words but it gets a little more complicated. So right now, the way I've done it here, I've shown it's a, it's a long word, like two by four pre-cut stud, nine foot, whatever. Uh, put that all in one word. And it's some kind of a convention where you name all your parts like that, and then you're just counting. And, and FreeCAD makes it a little easy in, in terms of having the spreadsheet workbench where you can get spreadsheets out, such as the, the parts list. But the more important thing is how do you organize, like when you're working in the FreeCAD, there's all this stuff that can start appearing within your your part tree so at the end you you want to simplify things uh, by and and that is done by what we showed yesterday it's it's about taking simple copies and and uh, first you, you can join things so if you've got many parts in this say the well say you just generated a, a some unique part that's got many steps within FreeCAD that will have that might have a, a long version history like within a part tree because the part tree if you put any feature on something that makes makes new parts within a part tree so at the very end what you're doing is um, let's just show a simple example with so we'll go back to um, say the architecture part library um, and just take a look at for example the nine foot frame what happened there so say you're uh, you know the bill of materials could be oh well you're just counting the nine foot frames exactly as they are because you know that that's how many parts you have you can do that um, at the level of counting individual pieces um, okay let's just take the eight foot pre-cut stud well that doesn't have a version history I want to take one that's got a version history that doesn't let's take let's take this uh, what I'm trying to show is the simplification process that we go through and where did all those ones go to um, let's download one of these here as, as an example so nine foot pre-cut stud just download that. The thing is, if you make an object, it's going to have a sketch underneath it. So in part workbench, what we do typically the workflow is go to part workbench and just simply go either like make compounds or make simple copies. If you have multiple objects that went into one part, so let's open this one. I mean, this is a super simple example. And this, what you have here is that, that box there means it's a solid object. It does not have the sketch underneath it. It was generated by taking the whatever, however you generated this. Uh, say you generated in part design, you would have a sketch. So let's actually do a quick example of an object that, say we, um, 
drop a new file, do a quick sketch of something, and then extrude that into a three three-dimensional object. What you'll see in your model is uh, so let's close the other one just to show that. So you've got the pad, but you've got this arrow here. You've got sketches underneath it. All you do is you go to back into part, and you go into part, make create simple copy, and then you have this this thing. So now erase the former. Uh, so you have that pad. So now I've got this simple solid object. It's got no history. It's going to be less memory. Uh, but that's how we work. In the part tree, you want to get rid of all the stuff. And, and the other reason why we don't, uh, well, why FreeCAD 19 is not great for this is uh, we're using FreeCAD 16 because you've got all those plain items within the part tree which confuse you. Like it, it'll be hard to extract, a little harder to extract all of that. You want this very simple object that you cannot get confused. It should have a name like, um, sorry. Um, so name it properly so you, you have the capacity to rename things and say this was the, that's a two foot two by four or whatever that is. You can name things effectively and keep track that way. So that's very simple. If you have multiple parts, so say I've got, uh, so go, but going back into, say your part <coughs> consists of some L bracket that you got, um, so build upon this you got this this kind of a shape that you've got hmm. so you've got this that's that's your part let's say once again if that's a part you get in the store you you know you want to collapse that into one part there you got two parts there plus the sketch underneath that um, get rid of all all the stuff you don't need uh, if this is one part because it should be one part in your part tree if you want to count it effectively so so once again in part you would go however you generated this in part you go to part create simple copy and now you've got this this other part here I'm just going hitting on the former things that were in the part tree and hitting the delete key so now I've got these two things and then in part you make a compound so now you made a compound but you see that compound actually contains those parts underneath that might confuse your part tree so now make a simple copy of that compound and that's all very simple so now now when, when I deleted that the the parts that were in it leaked out erase them just uh, take the compound so now we've got our for example L bracket uh, of some sort that's our object so it's a one unit thing within a part tree and now you can count it effectively uh, if you generate this from CAD like maybe you already got this CAD file from somewhere else like McMaster car has a full repository of, of parts in it uh, that you can then count then it, it might be in uh, already one item a lot of things you will download as step files might be multiple parts in a part tree so if you want to count that properly once again you would go to part and make a compound of that and then create a simple copy of that so um, to show you say an example of McMaster car um, or the way we we can make CAD effective is the first thing you want to do is look at all the known repositories out there um, for accurate parts like never try to reinvent the wheel um, there's a page a very useful page is um, uh, it has to be something like CAD repositories on a wiki so say uh, let, let's see if we can find it but CAD repositories there's plenty of them uh, there's things like part catalogs so the McMaster car is what I like to that's like a universal industrial supply they got a lot of different parts but there's many uh, this is a page we should be developing it's like in the future we should have catalog of everything like CAD repository we could link to our CD Cajon CAD repository here too but here we're including everything else um, and all kinds of other parts so McMaster car is a very useful one so go to McMaster car what you'll see like say you want a valve um, say a va valve 
this on off valve. It'll typically have CAD and you know it if it uh, you click on a part number and see that CAD product detail right all these things typically have CAD so here you select this uh, the, the step file right there 3D step and pretty soon there's FreeCAD's gonna appear there they don't have it yet but uh, FreeCAD is definitely up and coming so they're gonna have FreeCAD pretty soon but step is a universal exchange format so you download it um, and say you've got some biodigester that we're working on uh, so we downloaded that let's see how it opens up in FreeCAD so we'll go open it up the step file and it probably has threads in it it's fully detailed it's, it's taken a little bit of time to load so these are typically detailed files Uh, so yeah, it's still opening up, so that's like pretty heavy there. Uh, so you got this valve, and you, you see the way it opened up. So let's close this one, not to get confused in the part tree. So you see it came up with four part trees. It's got a separate handle, it's got a nut, it's got that, and then the whole body. So basically what that means, whatever software they used, the way they saved it, they exported it this particular way. Well, this would be pretty useless for you, like if you're actually doing inventory of parts as in a bill of, bill of materials. So let's collapse it. It is the solid object, so that's a good start. They don't have like any sketches or details underneath it. Um, so uh, select all of them, hit, sh hit the first one, and hit shift and select all of them. In part, make a, make a compound. Uh, part, that goes, it goes through the menu called part there. So make compound and it'll make a compound but the compound has all the stuff in there still so you probably want to take that make simple copy and there it goes now I'm gonna delete that one and all the parts leaked out of it so erase them so now you have a, a valve and this is ready for a bill of materials kind of work that's just uh, an example of uh, in a large process like there's a part out there if you were to search enough like you'd find a CAD part for anything GrabCAD is another place that's got a lot of files uh, you're always looking for a step they always have a lot of the solid works or whatever um, other formats uh, but those are proprietary formats the, the open ones you want to look for are step or IGES or SDLs that's also open formats um, and then for doing something complex if you have that awareness that oh yeah I can find any single part in the world then if you have a bunch of people that know this and they know FreeCAD and they can spatially orient themselves uh, in design then you can have rapid collaborative workflows I think uh, I mean it seems to me like that's a skill that because like design of things like design of our reality is pretty important I think that will be a more common skill in the future, I'd like to think, because it, I mean, it is pretty powerful, and it's becoming easier to do it. Like in the future, the tools where you can access all this will be like at your fingertips, because technology improves and access improves. Like right now, if you know about this, this is like we're, you know, this is almost like cutting edge info that oh, you can actually download any part in the world and start designing with it. That's that's pretty powerful. I mean, right now we can design very complex devices just of what's out there because all those complex parts are already out there and what's what might be missing is how do you design them but that's where the design guides and the kind of work that we do here to make transparent technology happen that's where it becomes important and uh, once people know that I think it's actually very de important for a democratic society that controls their destiny because without being able to control your environment, you're, you're subject to the people that are doing that. They control you. So for ultimate democratic society and freedom, you need this kind of, I think you really need this kind of ability in many, many people so that nobody's dependent on, on, on people who might have other interests. So, once again, autonomy, self-determination, uh, that kind of thing that comes into play uh, at this level. So, that's a little bit about that.
so one of the things that already exists for someone who would know is uh, the Seeker Home 2 model. So actually the full one, the most complete one, we don't have a full one in FreeCAD. We've got partial ones of all modules. There's some where there's like the, the foundation and walls. I've done that a bunch of time ago. But the Seeker Home 2 in Sweet Home, let's just go through that as far as how do you manage because that file's got so many parts in it, you really got to know how to work through it. Uh, so let's download that. And where would you go? Go to CD Go Home. Oh, let me uh, share my screen again. So how would you find that? Can you find that file? I would go to the CD Go Home 2 development board. Right there, CD Home V2. I would go to CAD. And I know this is under Katarina's Google Drive, so there it is. Um, it's actually this part, the supporting Rosebud model files, link number 19 there. So there it is. It's under technical. So we've got conceptual. There's a bunch of conceptual models there. We've gone through uh, var various variants, uh, different geometries, like, uh, so we can actually study that. Uh, you also have the modules, individual modules. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, there's tons and tons of cattle already now. Here's the conceptual, but we really want the technical because that's got the most transparent view if you're actually trying to understand how the thing is built. So you've got both the modules and these um, larger entities like a staircase, interior walls, bathroom, deck and carport, laundry. Here's this one is actually which one you want. The one next to last is the SH2 Technical Rosebud CA. That's the, this is the one of interest. Uh, so download that one. So if you download that, uh, regarding Sweet Home 3D, there's uh, make sure it works for you. So on my desktop, I had to use an older version because some new, some of this new stuff wasn't supported. Some old Java version wasn't supported or whatever. Make sure you download it and it actually works for you. No flicker, everything appears perfectly. Just make sure you get the right version. And, and the Sweet Home 3D web page is pretty good at that. How you get started and how you download. They've got pretty good documentation. So, uh, so I've got the technical model. Now we got to open up Sweet Home. Uh, it's it's on Linux. It's on OSC Linux. So. Uh, I'm using 16 and it's got, uh, I think I downloaded the more recent one, but I'm going to double click on that one. Um, and this is kind of where, to, if you're working between Sweet Home and FreeCAD, it's kind of useful to have more than one monitor because it takes some energy to switch between the two if you're working. Um, because the Sweet Home, once again, is really good for conceptual and visualization. It uh, doesn't have the technical capacities of FreeCAD. So I'm going to open this up. Uh, so the technical seed. Now seed is the, refers to the 1,000 square foot module because we mentioned about how you, it's designed for expansion. Right now it's designed for expansion that a similar module gets built on the back for another 1,000. So we get a 2,000 square foot house readily accessible. So this is C that refers to the first thousand square feet. I'm going to open that up. Okay, so now let's look at the part tree. Man, there's, so there's, this is exhaustive, like every single, every single building member is in here, like every piece of lumber. So this starts to get heavy. And it's, it's a little rough on the edges, like some of the details, like the corners aren't finished there and stuff like that. But the you can hide and un unhide things by clicking the check mark. So I'm gonna make everything disappear. Like one thing we want to look at is wall modules. Uh, how does the wall actually come together, and how does it join to the next wall? So I'm gonna just hide everything, and uh, I'm interested in the first floor. So it's actually named relatively well. It's like first floor I want to look at the back wall there like I want to look at the corner module we were playing around with uh, yesterday in a, in a workshop in real life so first story I'm gonna get rid of the front wall left and right wall 
top plate, sheathing. So I got the back wall here. I want to take a look at this corner module here. So that's actually, now here, the issue with, because it all unfolds, the way it's organized, it's grouped. So that's not super convenient because right now I cannot, if I check this one, everything disappears. I can't check the check off the other ones. You have to go right click, ungroup, and it calls it furniture because this is it's typically done for furniture. Katrina is just using that to do this. But uh, as I mentioned before, the entire model is just square blocks. Everything here is square blocks, cubic shape. It's a it's XYZ uh, elongated cubic shapes. Uh, what do you call that? three-dimensional cubic objects that are either stretched or flattened or whatever because uh, that's all you can do really within Sweet Home 3D outside of importing things like furniture and other things that you import from elsewhere as mesh files only thing you can do is make simple blocks but Katarina she's digital like that and she just said okay let's design an entire house in it because it allows you great capacity to do that you effectively like programming each block by block and putting coordinates to it. So it's pretty painful. Like, I wouldn't do that. That's, Freak Out is much faster at that, right? Um, but if you want this exactness and ability to put things at specific coordinates, well, Freak Out does that very well too. But here you've got, it's the visual, the nice interface that you have and all the furniture and plans and renders that you have within here. Okay, so we've got this huge part tree. So we're talking about accounting here. Well, I can go ungroup furniture right there, but it's like within all this other stuff. I, what I typically like to do, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to just control C, open up a new document, and control V, and now I just got control C on that one, and then control V into that. It's not doing it for me. Let's try that again. So control C, control V. There it is. Um, so that's the easiest way to do it. And now you can say, well, this is still one object. So now here in my new document, so now I just got this one wall. And this way, this is not, I mean, this is not super convenient. I think in FreeCAD, it's much easier because you can hide and group and ungroup things as needed here. It's, I would say it's very awkward because unless you ungroup it, you, when you check one thing, the whole thing disappears. So here, just go control, uh, basically right click and do ungroup furniture. Okay, so now we've got this thing that's ungrouped. Now you can hide the things accordingly. Uh, so I'm gonna hide everything uh, outside of the corner well no okay well I'm actually looking at that other corner back there so yeah I mean that's how you do it uh, now if you want to take this thing apart that thing's got all its details in there look at that I mean every single piece is in there you can keep unfolding that so this is a full uh, pretty complex model so once again I'm gonna take because I want to look at the details of this module and my part tree here is getting yeah kind of confusing you got all this stuff down here I'm just going to control C and uh, control V into a new document uh, now I think you gotta I think you gotta fold it back up to control C um, there's my single module that I have um, I mean, you can do this once you get the hang of this. You can just extract little parts. But yeah, it's kind of kind of painful to do this. But you can now here go go back, and now once again the whole thing disappears. So you gotta just ungroup this, and then uh, ungroup. Yeah, just ungroup everything. Like so now you got this one module. I'll, I'll just go in here, ungroup, ungroup. And that's it. That's that's all the parts as an individual. So now you can start studying this. How does this all go together? And then you can see this corner module. Like if you want to see, I know this is the back left corner here, actually. That's why I selected here. So the, the other corner would go on this side here. 
but you can study this for all the geometrical detail. But you have to, what, what I would suggest is control C and control V into a new document because the master document is so heavy that you're going to kind of get confused. Now here I can see every single part, okay, that's pretty clear, I can examine it. If you're building this in a workshop and this is finalized, yeah, this is this would be good. But I still would prefer FreeCAD to, to view all of this um, simply because it's like easier to navigate and you could have the entire model and just hide and unhide things by hitting the space bar within FreeCAD. So practice this if you want to want to have full access to this document. Any questions on how what I did here? Because that's like that's the fullest model we have right now that can get you oriented around the whole thing. How far is the, uh, the FreeCAD model? Because uh, I mean. It, you can see the things in, in Sweet Home, but it's, it's just, it's really good for the interior design. For example, yeah. the overall architecture and seeing the different, like, engineering features that you need to account for. You tell me. Where are we? <laughs> uh, there, uh, as I said, if we do a full digital model, unless it's a BS model, you can quickly go into a conceptual model, you can show the box, you can show the windows, you can show this and that. But what we're doing right now with the CAD that we're doing as a group, with all those red files that we're turning blue, that's what we're doing for the full digital model. Uh, so we're at like maybe 50% done on that. But once we have that, like I mentioned earlier, we have all those modules, we arrange them. Once you have them, it's very easy to just take 1 through 24 and put them into the first floor. Say we've got the second floor level. Someone does that. In a click, you, you merge it into that. So that kind of a build process, if we had 100 or 200 people in a day doing that, but it, that time adds up, right? There's, there's about 100 modules or so together. Uh, each one of them needs to be developed. Uh, there's many iterations. So like a full digital model could take you as little as like a hundred hours if you knew exactly what you're building. But in the process we're still iterating, we're innovating, uh, simplifying. Uh, so we're not doing like nobody does this at this level. Like an architect is gonna just give you that that shell and what do we call it here BS model. It doesn't have the detail. Um, so they're not really, and that's, that also explains why housing is inefficient because, yeah, you just get these general models and the tradespeople build them. It's never optimized like what we're trying to do here. And that's, that's the digital housing 2.0 concept. So um, we can do that. That's why I keep saying that the problem of open source, like modular design, uh, so we know that product development, the latest in product development, if you read the papers, says modular open design is the future. So that's why I, also, I keep telling you guys that it's obvious that the open source economy is forthcoming. Um, I think that's pretty clear. Now, for that kind of process to work, that's, we're leading the way here saying, okay, we're teaching, teaching a bunch of people very low access barrier skills, what we think is low access barrier. It's not really, once you know them, once you know the things, once you know the theories and principles and practice, it becomes common knowledge. Like today, it's common knowledge that we make rocket ships and cell phones. Uh, it's not exactly common knowledge, but it's commonly done. Um, you know, there's levels how that can happen and how, how information and power can spread throughout civilization through individual people. Um, I do believe this open design, open collaborative modular design is a way to go because then you take any problem and you can just call on your posse of people uh, who, are, who know this and in a second you got it, like you solve a design problem, you, um, something like that. Uh, collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. That's the that's the result where uh, we're eliminating the material scarcity issues. Um, any questions on what we actually have in this digital model? How to get it? Get to it. So so the suggestion here would be download that model. Make sure your sweet home is working well for you, and basically extract the part you need into another document. Um, 
a useful thing would be for example to create a part library there is no part library of this this is now this file is an item out of many in Katarina's Google Drive it would be useful to say take this and extract all those parts and get a nice visual index which we call the the part library concept you haven't done this for this house that would be something worth doing so that you know say you want that far corner module right now I should be saving that and putting that in a part library and just separating that whole model so it's easily accessible because right now you have to do the copy and set up a, the new document and so forth it's um, it's not accessible at this point so okay. you can create access by doing part libraries eventually software that you know you can design things like this online uh, work design workbenches within FreeCAD that allow you to design this readily uh, using the OSC Workbenches platform that we already have. It's basically you can put in buttons that allow you to click onto uh, a part and that appears in your, your working window and just have all your parts as buttons uh, or you can have also the modules as buttons. So that's where we want to get to. Um, that's, that's the end goal. Like By the six months here I think um, it would be more than success if that was <laughs> like I, I'd like to see that FreeCAD designer where all the parts are in there, they're refined, and we've built a couple of, of them and tested that okay all this works, now you're actually designing it readily we can, we'd have to freeze it, we have to decide to freeze this somewhere like okay no more changes at all like absolutely that's it, <laughs> we need to decide on a freeze at some point because we can keep um, developing this thing forever uh, so freeze a version, uh, put a FreeCAD designer, I think the FreeCAD designer is the easiest way with open tools right now that you can get to this rapid design capacity. Also with Sweet Home. In Sweet Home you can you can make part libraries. You can actually import a library where then you click on that thing and it appears in your view window just like you click in to get a piece of furniture. So imagine a, an interface within S Sweet Home which is actually the easier way to go than a FreeCAD. Like if you want conceptual design we'd want somebody within S Sweet Home creating that library that means cleaning up all the parts even the model that we have right now could pretty much if someone sits down on that you can take that you can drag and drop all the modules and create all kinds of iterations extremely powerful that's like ready to be done right now anyone can do this pretty much because all it means is that you put all your parts into a folder and you um, up, you work from that folder within Sweet Home 3D that could be online you can um, we can release a Sweet Home OSC CD Home Sweet Home 3D Edition where you download that with all the parts already so you're just dragging and dropping. That's like low hanging fruit right now. That's, that's the kind of possibility we have within fully open software. So that's worth doing. It's just, you know, we're still developing, refining. Um, but even with what we have right now, you can right now take the modules we have for the CD Home 1 and you can do that immediately right now because that that works we changed a few things to make things more efficient but you can build that right now it's a beautiful functional home doesn't have any type 1 bugs in it it, it all works uh, we're making it better and more efficient so um, that's the kind of work like in terms of the remote community of people looking at us through the internet and observing the project, there's many things you can get, get involved in. It all takes energy, but once done, it's like it's, a, it's available and everyone can benefit from it. So it's definitely worthwhile work when it's open and solved once and lives forever. So, okay. So getting back to, let's, let's just go briefly through doors and windows design. We'll, we'll go through that and... Um, best way to do that uh, we do have a couple of modules that are actually completely as of now th those were some of the last things I was working on that's door and window modules and they are actually completely correct digital models so let's just open that up in FreeCAD so uh, where do you go SH2 CAD see home v2 CAD it's in the part library that we're working on there's um, so let's take a look at module number I would say three. 
three, if you look at the map of the house, is the door to the door to the carport. Uh, before a door, uh, let's go to a window, which is actually less complicated in terms of design and build. That window is actually less complicated than a door because it's basically an aperture within one of our regular modules. So let's take a look at that. Wall module 18 is the one that we want to look at. See, home. See. Um, yeah, so let me share my screen again. Uh, so I'm in the part library here. I'm going to seh2wall18.fcstd. That's what you want to download. Click on that. Download that. And that's got a version history of a few parts there. Um, you see the last version is smaller, which implies that it's probably being have, has been cleaned up by taking out the sketches or maybe making it into a simple object. Let's see where it is, because that actually... Yeah, so in an, like typically under files, the, I put notes, and you're encouraged to put notes. So I'm saying that V9, V this from 22 of June is for assemblies. Um, I think the last one, let's see what the last one gives us. But I think that's going to give us a, I'm going to shut down this sweet home. I think I have to open up FreeCAD again here because this app image seems like it closes after every so often. But we'll open up module 18 and let's see what we've got in there. So, yes, as I mentioned, it's just a simple copy. And I could tell that by the file size in a, in a version history. It was 27K, the largest ones were like 50 or 100. Uh, so I can't really do much in terms of hiding and unhiding parts. You can only hide the whole thing. Uh, but that's how it looks like. Uh, you, you can still see the back. Um, and that's a start. So let's actually look at this simple file here to study what's going on. Well, at the top, the frame does not extend all the way to the top. You've got this header. That's because the weight of the house above it is upon this. So in order for this not to collapse, you can't just have a top plate. You have to have this vertical, these two vertical members. It's called a header. This header is supported by one, two, three, four. By four of those full studs there and then there's also um, these ones here that I'm pointing to the ones above the window they don't really hold the weight uh, what's holding the weight all the weight of what's above is these uh, the edge the four that are on the edge the loads from these they're not significant because you've got this double header there uh, that carries all that weight, transfer, transfers it to these vertical studs. What's the window like? Like, okay, so you have to know things like, okay, where are you going to put this window? What's the standard height? Well, just look at what a st standard height of a window is and, and do it there. The hole for the window is basically like one half inch larger than the window itself. So when you buy the window, it says it's got this rough opening. And I think here it's like 36 by 42 or something like that. We can measure that readily. Um, so the rough opening for the window Yes, it's 42 by 36. Uh, when you get these windows at the store, it's going to be called a 36 inch window. And that refers to the size of the rough opening. It doesn't necessarily mean that's, I mean, how do you define a window? Is it the outer rim of it? Is it the glass? Whatever. It's just called a 36 inch window. When you get that, it will tell you what kind of rough opening it has. But that's basically the idea here. You've got a rough opening. You still have the studs in the middle. Like the, and what, what spacing? What, what would you guess would be the spacing on the middle one? 14 inch, yes. Exactly. The, the side ones are going to be a little shorter. And what are they here? Um, I forget what they are. So the, the, the side ones are 11. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, because when you look at these two spaces more here, 
that's another 3 combining to 14 so this one plus the space here you know that it adds up to 14 like it should because we're trying to keep everything to 14 for standard insulation like comes in the United States um, so yes uh, that's that what's the height of this thing that's gonna be the same as that's the interior plywood that's the this is the interior that's gonna be where the utility channel goes so this is gonna be the same height as what we have on a regular nine foot panels so you can identify the height of this exactly like we have experience with um, only th thing you have to read from this to build this right is well what's what's the actual uh, height of this this bottom plate of the window the sill plate of the window uh, and that's going to be determined by so this is standards here that we're just going by normal window heights and that means our measurement there is uh, what is that it's drew that crooked it's 35.5 I was measuring is that what it is so this member here measuring that ah, lost it so measure it there to there we have it's about 35 is it exactly 35 let's measure it again this Partial. corner to this corner yep is there a way to get the dimensions of those parts without Doing a ruler measurement. If you have the sketches underneath, absolutely. So let's so let's that's a good time to go into the former file. So in the version history, yeah, because this that that's hard. You have to zoom in. So let's make it easier. I'm gonna go back. So in the notes in here, it's this is for assemblies. Like this is where we put things together. Uh, so nine. Oh wait, no, assemblies, sorry, it means the other way around. This file at the end, which is the last one, the 22 of June version 912, this one right here, for assemblies means that we can build larger things with it. That's one object, and it should, and that's it, actually labeled first floor window, cool. So we go back and we want to go back to the largest one because that probably has all the detail. So there I mentioned simple copy of com compound. So yes, this one right here, 97K. I'm going to open that and it's um, all 18 here. So that's got all the assemblies. So I'm going to close the other one to not get confused. Close that. So th this is all the parts in there. So what do you think that would be? That would be, um, they're called cripples. That's a cripple number four there. But you'll read it off the sketch. It says 36.5. Yeah. So I would suggest actually into the workshop, downloading the file I just downloaded here, and then you can tell everything about it because it's got all the detail. And if you want to modify this, then you can. If you want to shift the window up a little bit, you edit this file. So you're going to want to know the dimensions of this one. You're going to want to know the dimensions of that one. Uh, the top cripple, which is this cripple to here. So that, for example, just double click on a sketch and you'll see, okay, that's 10, 10 and 3 eighths. And that's the standard 1.5 inch um, on edge. So you can read all of this information. So this would be something to have in the workshop uh, as we're building these and we'll start these today see how many we can get built but this is good this is um, I can vouch for this I, I check this uh, still may be wrong but I'm pretty sure it's this is all good so ideally you take the window it pops right in and we've got a correct module uh, but as long as the hole is the right size it's we already checked it was 36 by 42 yeah it's gonna work um, so just make sure that all the windows we make are at the same height but that's yeah that will happen because I actually copied this one over to the module 19 because the 19 is another window that's identical so yeah. so version one should always contain or there should be a version that contains the sketches just yes. for reference to the exact measurements because you can exactly measure but it's never going to be quite uh, that's exactly right if you and that's the purpose 
of the version history within the wiki. We're not going to GitHub or anything like that. We're in a wiki, and we also have some of the visual version history. So if you go to the actual technical history, the first would be like, I started this here. So you can see how I started drawing this up. I added more detail, the files, files growing and growing. Then I made a simple copy for some reason, maybe because I was testing it out in assembly or something. But this we could probably, like, there's really no purpose in that one. I could just delete that right now because it's probably confusing people, so just delete that. Um, go back to, go back to here. I don't think you guys can de delete, only the admins can delete stuff, but you can add things. Um, but here you go look at the numbers here 54 74 97 97 so here I'm increasing features here I'm probably correcting some stuff then I made a simple copy because it was near final something like that and then probably in these versions here I probably took out more parts simplified whatever to end up with this 27 maybe made some whatever I did there not sure um, but I like to do this upload so like what's the time 522 like 905 910 912 so I was working on this actively here I made some changes I was working on act so you see like every few minutes do that like save your stuff on the wiki it doesn't hurt and then the next person might actually beat you to it if you actually have a large team working on this and you've got active development uploaded so that you go away for lunch and and then you see somebody did the next version and you can take off after di after lunch because it's already done so h allow people to help you allow people to help you by uploading as soon as you have something and that really does work I can tell you that like uh, well I'm working on something and somebody else takes it. and it's just a great feeling it's like you're working hard on that somebody else saw it they're following the wiki history you can see recent wiki changes or they're actually working on this file so they see this version history they do it and it's like oh great well, we're moving forward and you don't really have to worry about conflicts because if you don't like it download the file that you like reconcile it at the end second Toyota paradox reconcile as far into the future as you can because all this could be useful what if somebody takes the older file and says okay I want to go this direction um, we don't need to reconcile also because every hardware build is a fork. That's I want to explain that. Do people know what I mean by that? Every hardware build is a fork. Now in software you've got code and if you change that code it might be a fork you might be doing something different uh, building a different version. Um, in hardware anytime somebody builds something you're guaranteed to be a fork because you're not building it the same way. Just the fact that you have different materials or different tools means that you actually are building it if you look at the details you're building it differently it's not the same reality you have to say and agree that every hardware build is a fork because that's if you agree to that you will know that you have to document that in a certain way you have to as soon as you we build the next version of this uh, this house you want to set up the v2 with where you pull forward all the former stuff but if somebody replicates this in China, they really have to document all of it. It won't be to s enough to say, oh, we just followed their instructions. No, they have to document everything because they're doing things differently. They're getting materials from different places. They might have substitutions and all of that. So you have to treat it as a fork because it will be. It can't be identical unless you're using... You know, you're having uh, the same code compiled using the same compiler. There's like, there's less difference within code. In, in hardware, it's the physical reality. So even when the wind blows, <laughs> that could be a fork because your, your thing fell down. <laughs> I don't know, whatever. Um, so consider that, which helps resolve the, the edit conflicts because if you see that it's a fork, you see that it's okay that you can make a new file, just copy the whole development template 
uh, call it a new version and you can say like so the way I like to look at it is and that resolves the early crash of the wiki where we had people do, do different versions and you no longer knew what was what went with what that works for like you got a little solo project but once you go global it collapses very fast uh, you have to have some some form of versioning so the thing that works really well and is super simple and <clears throat> that we use right now is you're cloning the dev dev plus template <clears throat> as soon as you you want to build your own you want to build this house in Tennessee so you're doing that first thing clone that template don't think that you're gonna contribute back to ours because you're not you're not really contributing back to ours like not the build um, you have to clone yours for the, the details you can't contribute something some things like maybe the CAD applies to maybe an update of CAD for example applies to our build here and it will apply to yours there so maybe yeah we can put it back into that old version but the idea is that clone it and then you'll see say call it v2 or v3 well all the items in the development template will be read because it's seeded v3 which is a new hyperlink to new content if you really want to transfer everything that we did simply go and go edit let's show an example just in real life so let's do a test test development template so whatever I, I start a new page I'm making uh, CD home so uh, I do the template oh uh, let me oh yeah let me share the screen um, so let's let's look at how the forking works because this is important in terms of global collaboration where now you're building your own things and we want to actually learn from it as opposed to it disappears in the ether because you don't know where, what's what and we don't have any standards for documentation. So the, here's, here's what I would sh uh, show you and encourage you to do as soon as you start building anything of ours because every hardware build is a fork. So, so you start a project, I'm going to subst the dev plus template, pipe in the name seed home Tennessee. Who wants to go to Tennessee? Is that who's going to Tennessee? You're going to Tennessee. Okay. So you're building your house. You're building your house. So you did this. Well, yeah. There you go. Um, so you got all the reds. So what are you going to do for the the CAD? Well, uh, you can just say if you're going to build the exact same thing, or you think you're going to build the exact same thing, just say I'm using using the old CAD at so let's say um, so you go home to CAD you can simply do the simplest thing would be like control C here and then you just go if you're not changing anything you can this is how you pull forward all the info from before so now you just have documented everything we know about CAD that's it. Now if you're going to start changing that, then here you would go edit and then I'm going to seed my own. Okay, so now I'm going to do part library for the things I changed. Um, and you will go subst that substitutes the template and it's called gallery. That's the gallery is what's called in the wiki. So now you just seeded a uh, part library. Now you, fill your things that you're working on um, so work it like that basically carry over with a hyperlink all the stuff that's been done before there's no other system to do it right now there's nothing that exists that can get you all the complexity of what you need to d document with an open hardware you can certainly use github but, but you can do that for the code part of it so say we're working on a code for the, the game or we're working on the designer or even a sweet home 3d part library designer uh, the design within Sweet Home. Uh, feel free to go. Okay, on a on a software part, link to those repositories so you can nest and layer it, and as as you need. But this thing, if we could learn as a community to just simply fork projects this way by seeding a new development template, uh, this is one way to do it. There's, you can refine this forever. This does work. It's got. It's you just. So here we just seeded the entire record of technical due diligence so now you've got the CAD already that's started 
um, this now I can look at this and actually make sense of it like I know you're you're in Tennessee I know you're working on this I can follow you you don't even have to tell me updates I can see this and look at this if I know that you're an active developer I would check in here and see what's going on and then we might improve the infrastructures of communication and things like that with forums and other real-time communications or whatever do the thing like uh, we started doing well the flashy XM thing where you've got I keep going back to this thing like basically a, a dashboard of you got windows that show you like a lot of different stuff that's going on I mean just simple stuff like that um, so that you're you're able to take the wiki and use it for many many purposes like that uh, many different assets embedded uh, actually cool thing like this conversation right now that we're having like say you have your development template um, so in here you're working on this a simple embed of the Jitsi meet right now could be such an enhancement right here so so you've got this development and you actually have a window where people are developing this in real time in the full evolution of the project you'll see something like this you have a control it's like your control room you've got the windows because the project is super active like I go to this to your project and there's actually like people in real time working on it maybe you have a window with real CAD somebody just sharing their screen and working on it like you can do this kind of stuff in this hacked uh, you know wild way until you find something that really sticks and there's a pattern that is like wow I'm going I'm gonna hang out at at the Seat Home Tennessee page because there's a lot of cool stuff there's media there that you can follow updates with you might have feeds of the actual build in real time right now so, but it takes all energy like um, it takes a lot of energy there's a lot of lot of knowledge and resource going into that but once the projects are really active and developed uh, you will have that kind of activity and we're trying to set ourselves up for that how do you how do you set yourself up for amazing activity that you know this is right now upgradable like if we've got you know say the summer X and we're building say the CD go home actively just a live feed from that would make turn this into like this live action spot mm -hmm. and you'd see these things changing you hit refresh and you're you're this thing's actually growing because people are working on it real time that's but that would be like a thousand people working on it and or many thousands of people and then you can see like real-time progress that's just a vision of what could happen in terms of rapid development that's that's actually got a purpose the purpose is we're actually developing real products like we're solving housing we're creating that ten thousand dollar home that that's all you need to pay instead of 1.2 million dollars over an average individual's lifetime that's that's about what people pay for a lifetime there's a nice page on the wiki called cost of living uh, and <laughs> for perspective this is what we're solving we're solving the cost cost of living which the average sucker in the United States spends about um, let's see what's the lifetime cost here but that's um, cost over a lifetime over 78 years of a typical US lifetime one spends an average of about 1.6 million dollars just to survive like food housing fuel cars uh, that doesn't include anything else so those costs are significant the housing is the biggest one of them I think it's what is that housing out of all of them is the number one uh, out of a 20,000 average in the United States housing is like seven so it's about a third so a third of that 1.6 million that's not even so much I mean you know five hundred thousand dollars you spend over a lifetime well it's still more than ten thousand if you could do that ten thousand plus renewable energy plus aquaponic greenhouse and food automated food growing or whatever and then you can focus on other things than just making a living so um, that's just just an aside to this what this kind of collaborative development really is is after that we're uh, making life easy so people can follow self-determination autonomy mastery and purpose that's the latest theory on how what motivates people okay so then we cover everything so that's that's the window um, okay we're getting a little late here so I think we'll we'll leave the window for today we'll go to the door later so uh, in the window you want to look at if you want to look at the details if you're building this bring your computer you can rotate this around you can go into viewpoints of one 
through 6. Perspective and PNO in 16 gets you this. This is perspective. It looks better. Like always take pictures within perspective view, not orthographic view. That looks pretty dumb. This is like realistic. Always take pictures for the part library in perspective view, otherwise it looks weird. Um, but you can read all the info of this and we can build this exactly so we can hide and unhide things. Hide that. Hide that, the sheathing. We, that's how we did the sheathing. That's the trim. Uh, hide the trim. So that's we're not doing the trim yet. That's an, after you install the window. But the point of the endpoint of a window is the the trim. Because we can put in the window, the trim, the actually the house wrap. Uh, but but today we can probably start on this. Um, getting to this point here um, now orthographic helps when you're looking at from the, the angle so that's this helps when you're just looking at trying to get dimensions and everything so there's a double header these are all 2 by 12s uh, if you look at that that's gonna be 11.25 that's how much a 2 by 12 is uh, the tops are once again this this is all 2 by 6 lumber here uh, plus our standard uh, blocking so we've got experience with a lot of this the new part is the header that needs to be cut to how long how long is the header forty eight inches these are once again all our standard modules this is, the size is not different this is going to be the exact same height and width as the other modules so that you can interchange this for another module. So think about you building a house, a nice greenhouse, you can put a bunch of windows like this. It will be expensive because uh, windows are expensive. But yeah, you can now with these modules, door modules, and regular wall modules in the corners, uh, you can literally design and build a house using these parts here. So we can read all the dimensions up here. The structural thing is the header is what carries all the weight. Those two pieces on edge can hold, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's a, uh, this is rated for, um, you need two headers like this, you might need three of them if you have a wider span, but for this kind of span by code, you read this from code, if you have a four foot span, you need two of these two by, you actually need two by ten, but we are using two by twelve since we're getting rid of any two by tens to simplify the bill of materials, and it's not too much more money, uh, it's stronger. Uh, since we use 2x12s in the roof and other places, we, we just said, okay, let's just use that. Let's not introduce any 2x10s because altogether in the entire house, we don't use anything but 2x6, 2x4, and 2x12. So we just said, okay, let's simplify the bill of materials. Martin, would you yep. avoid putting joists through the floor above on a window unit because it's weaker? Or I don't know, is it weaker? Like, because it can't support as much weight. Uh, I don't understand the question. Um, so all the extra support is to uh, allow it to support the same weight as other wall modules yeah but i think it's still not going to be as strong so would you avoid joists for the floor above uh or you know rest no. on the wall module would you avoid putting them on a window unit because you know that it's weaker if you wanted to avoid the header possibly but then what you end up with is a hole in your second floor so then you have to address if I need 12 or 24 inch spacing for the joists, okay. how are you going to span that? You'll probably have to double up the joists around and put joy put other members in between. So yes, you can do that, okay. but it will be lower cost to do this because you're simplifying and actually probably using less materials to do this. And, and this does carry the same weight. Okay, it's not weaker. It, it okay. does. It's not it's weaker. So you're so normally you got four. Um, studs in there. Sure. You still have four studs, yeah. and then that header is just transferring the load over to your other okay. studs. That's great. That makes sense. Yep. Any other questions? So, so today what we're going to be doing is continuing. Well, we're, we've got our design. So we're still. We asked the question, where are we on a CAD? You guys tell me. Where are we? And we got to finish it all. And as we said, it's copy and copy and paste to the ones that are the same. At the end of the day, we'll s let's actually define the convention as 000, zero, zero is the corner, the bottom left corner of the house looking from the, from the front. 
That means, for example, if one of us is working on corner module number five, you know that's 32 feet over and 16 feet over the other way. So in your CAD, you can actually put it in there in the right place. What I would do is draw yourself a box on the XY axis. That's the, the floor plan of the, the building. It's not complicated, it's a rectangle with exactly 16 by 32. And then you can locate your module so that after you're done with this module and we merge the entire product, it's actually all done. We don't even have to assemble it. It's already assembled because you, you did it in the positionally correct location. So that's, uh, we should aim for that. Uh, but right now we still got a bunch of the modules as far as the remote people. Uh, we can, uh, if you guys can help us doing more of the, the CAD modules that would help us help us out. Um, and once again, the, the division of labor is such that if we've got those sheets that allocate roles, just put your name on it. And if it's red, do it. Hey, the spreadsheet seemed to have worked yesterday. Why don't we create a spreadsheet for the, the wall modules? Um, okay. Like as in, the, is the CAD ready? Okay. We can just add a column to what we did yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Add a column. So yesterday we sp started a spreadsheet which we had people working in progress, done, like a simple spreadsheet for the stuff we were building in a workshop. We can add the next column is, okay, CAD. Is the actual CAD considered done or in progress or so forth? So let's just add that and embed it into today's uh, today's notes or today's uh, 120, uh, what's it called? 120 design lessons, uh, day five. So we're on day five. Right, so that Paul just pasted the status spreadsheet. Uh, let's just keep track of the of the cat in there too so we can be very clear about it and you can see like perhaps color it green once it's done uh, it might be a little easier to see than in the wiki which has got a wall that's a little higher it's a, it's a pretty good wall of images it's good for visual orientation it's not as easy to track it since there's a couple of files in there there's like the free cat file and the sweet home file and the documentation file under each library part so a simple spreadsheet would help us uh, anything else we want to cover because we just want to continue on um, on the modules and uh, some people who feel confident about the windows I think the windows are actually I think the windows and, and doors are all done I think I did that there may be some couple missing but we basically look at the model of this one and see if it's identical we've got only two types of windows the ones on the bottom floor are a little smaller there's 36 by 42 the ones on the top floor are larger they are 36 by 60 so that's the difference nice uh, nice windows large windows on the second floor and in order to do that just the trick on this house style we're using these small windows on the first floor but trimming it up so it looks like a big window so it looks like like a more expensive house so it's a way to get <laughs> use lower cost windows and still make the house look much better and that's a, that's the trick we're using there um, and also like for first floor security it's probably smaller windows may be decent too if you're concerned about break-ins um, depending where you are yeah so any questions uh, I need a cut list cut list we can generate cut lists for for the windows uh, maybe I can work on that and get you that mm -hmm. uh, other people can do CAD uh, so yeah, when we get into the workshop at one, we have all the materials ready and we can start assembling that. Maybe a few people get on, uh, if you want to change a pace or if you want to build more of the simpler ones, go ahead. I know we've got more corners to do, so maybe uh, do some more corners, then go to the windows. Because the windows, the only concern about that is once we put those windows out there, careful about breaking them. Um, Maybe can we get on top of the? Do you think the rack would still work, or forget about that idea? We talked about setting up a rack um, where we can stash all the modules next to each other. Well, the only spot where we've got room is where that um, that um, router is. Oh slide. man! Um, Let's slide that router back. Should we, should we try to slide it back? And we could. Yeah. I could, I could go Let's ahead and build the, the rack up top yeah. while, before everybody gets there. Up top or even there, whichever is easier? Uh, Which is just easier. going across, just put a, a board across there and put my pieces on it. Yeah. So yeah. I could go ahead and 
pivot or even one, uh, pivot it up, screw the other one in. And then how about even uh, from the top, because there's a top wooden beam, just hang down one by twos, two by twos, and that'll be your slots for the. We can have like 16 right there, which would be yeah. a lot of them. Maybe we could use that for the wind window modulation. Yeah. Yeah. Do something like that. Something simple. Yeah, Don't get that. sucked into it. Um, into a time sink. Yeah. Okay. Um, Excellent. So any other questions for regarding the design of the wall modules? So now you know, to summarize, you know how to extract the Sweet Home 3D files, <coughs> uh, take all the information out of that. However, they're not the far up updated ones. A lot of it is correct. Maybe the blocking is not at the right height or maybe the corner module. I know the corner modules are missing the, the nailing board, the two by four that's now visible. Do we have that in Sweet Home uh, in FreeCAD? I don't think we have any of the I think we have some of the corner modules in FreeCAD, but uh, there's definitely more to be done there. You can use the conceptual model, the technical model in Sweet Home for overall orientation and general picture. And a lot of those details are correct, but just not not everything, because some of the walls are already updated. Um, but once again, save everything. Once you have it, don't worry about uploading it numer numerous times to the wiki. Uh, so that we can go to, to make changes and sometimes we might revert and, and start from an earlier version So so don't be shy about uploading all the versions memory is cheap there. So The FreeCAD files we're working on are very simple. They're like a hundred K Scale so it doesn't cost us in terms of memory and those are all uh, valuable designs because uh, we're, we're getting towards there So we've got the sweet home. We've got more FreeCAD and we can start designing the window modules uh, or um, making build instructionals for them, reading off them, reading the dimensions from them. And hopefully some someone in the background, like that would be a great task for the remote community, is the designer in, in FreeCAD. So take a look at OSC Workbench's platform. So I want to put that link in there again. OSC Workbench's platform for FreeCAD. Uh, anyone take a look at that that's a call to the world extremely powerful low-hanging fruit because we can readily in Python put in buttons into FreeCAD basically workbenches with the functionality of dragging down parts for design technically correct parts for design so we can rapidly design new versions uh, that's that we can do and then on a the sweet home uh, do we have an article on sweet home part library uh, sweet home 3d um, seed eco home I'm gonna search it part library we don't have too much written on that uh, there's some um, sweet home 3d part library it's somewhere there's some article on on there regarding can't find it somewhere I think under there's a bunch of pages on CD Co home and sweet home there's definitely a page called sweet home that's on my log I, I did a page on sweet home and free cat interoperability take a look at that um, there's a bunch of things like how do you do batch import of multiple parts because what's going to happen if you want a technically correct thing for explosions you want to save all the individual parts within blender sweet home 3d or FreeCAD. so in that point you don't want to have the single file for bill material generation but maybe you want to have very much divided file with many many parts there's workflows where you do batch imports all of FreeCAD, Sweet Home and Blender it all has supports that kind of functionality by plugins so that's all in there um, but um, between Blender, Sweet Home, FreeCAD the OSC workbenches in FreeCAD and the simple part library within Sweet Home 3D which is effectively like when you when you open up Sweet Home 3D you drag and drop furniture into your your house 
uh, well, imagine that furniture now being our wall modules and parts, and that's just as simple as creating a folder with all the, all the right parts and using them. That's as simple as that. So that kind of level of functionality is low-hanging fruit. We, we want to do that. So that's definitely good work for some remote collaborators. Anything else? Okay, so I think we're pretty good, and let's uh, get back. So for now, the focus would be to uh, get as many of those CAD items finished as possible. I'll work on some of the cut lists, then we'll be building in the afternoon. Take a look at the videos from yesterday on our channel. Talk later. <laughs>